this is an app. So I took those photos, right? Yeah, so push your phone out. My name is Jeremy Morrison, and I'm one of the rabbis here at Temple Israel. Um, I'm also, I've learned, one of like five Jeremys in this room. I knew coming over here tonight there would be at least two Jeremys, but there are now five that I've met, and I, I just want to say on behalf of all the Jeremys in this space, that's a very unusual occurrence. So many Jeremys in one place, particularly on a snowy evening. In the five minutes that I've been given to speak to you this evening, I want to offer you a word of welcome and a word of Torah. So first, a word of welcome. If you are new to our congregation, if you've never been in this building before, I welcome you to our extraordinary community. And if you are a member of Temple Israel, are you a member of Temple Israel? Yes. Nice. It is always so good to be with you, no matter the weather. So it's good to see you all. It's good, too, to welcome back into our midst Jeremy ben -Ami, the president of J Street. And it's also an honor to welcome you, M.K. Mitznah. Welcome to Temple Israel. It's really an honor to have you with us tonight. As you all know, tonight's gathering is part of J Street's national effort to build a great constituency for peace. There is, however, a very localized context for this town meeting and its occurrence here at Temple Israel. During the past two and a half years, our congregation has been intensively exploring the complexities of our individual and communal relationships with Israel, both as people and place. Through our communal conversations, courses, lectures, and travel opportunities, we have begun to confront feelings of alienation on the part of many congregants. We have promoted reconciliation within a community comprising diverse political views. And we are becoming engaged with local and national efforts to promote peace, security, and equality, both within Israel and between Israel and its neighbors. For us at Temple Israel, tonight's town meeting serves as a component of this new and enduring stage in our project. And one of our two Israel engagement groups, the Two State Task Force, is a co-sponsor of this evening, of this event. And now, a Devar Torah, a word of Torah. The word is you, Atam. It is the second word of this week's Torah portion, with which, in unusual emphasis, God addresses Moses. And you. You shall instruct the Israelites to bring you pure olive oil for healing the eternal lamp. This unusual form of address to Moses, the Atah, and you, becomes more insistent. It recurs twice within the first five verses of the portion. And you, you shall bring forward your brother Aaron with his sons to serve me as priests. The Atah, and you, you shall speak to all who are wise of heart whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. Traditional commentators observe the threefold repetition of Be'ata and this intensified focus on Moses. Commentators note, too, that this week's portion is usually read during the week in which the date traditionally associated with Moses' death occurs, the seventh of Adar, which is this Friday. Over time, rabbinic interpretation has interwoven Petirat Moshe, the leaf-taking of Moses, with the events of the portion. Interpreters read Moses' actions of elevating Aaron to new leadership as preparation for a post-Moses reality, a laying of the groundwork for the Israelites to respond to the challenge of fulfilling the terms of an eternal covenant after the death of Moses. Like our ancestors, we Jews, live in a post-Moses reality. And so this, too, is our never-ending challenge. How will we fulfill the terms of our covenant, called at times of Rit Shalom, a covenant of peace? Or more particularly, on this night 
and to use the first and second words of our portion, ve'ata, and you, how will you fulfill its terms? What will you do to promote peace in Israel? Ve'ata, and you, what will you do to ensure its security? Tonight, J Street asks, will you join the great constituency of peace? Our tradition also poses a similar question. Indeed, it imposes a demand that transcends pacts and politics. This week, in our Torah portion, we read of Aaron's impending elevation to the high priesthood. In the Mishnah, we read this well-known teaching about Aaron, and about us, and about you. B of the disciples of Aaron, love peace and pursue peace. So how will you be a disciple of Aaron? Ve'ata, and you, how will you love peace and pursue it? Political leaders will never take risks if the people do not push them to take some risks. You must create the change that you want to see. I believe that the only way to keep the values of the State of Israel as a Jewish democratic state is to enter the negotiations room and end the conflict with the Palestinians in accordance to the idea of two states for two peoples. If we don't have a two-state solution, we don't have the Jewish state. There is no option but a two-state solution. A state of Palestine, to live in peace and security next to the state of Israel. Everybody's so loyal and looking after us, but it's not looking after us. You have to support Israel to get out of the occupied territories. American Jewish involvement in this is very, very important. We need world Jewelry telling us Israelis, please come to your senses. We need you, the American Jews, to speak out and to speak very clear and support the idea of two-state solution. The survival of Israel depends on achieving the two-state solution. Real Zionism today is helping Israel to find a solution to our neighbors. Help the administration to help us in order to get the two-state solution. A two-state solution that will bring an end to the conflict between us and the Palestinians and will create peace that will secure more than anything else the future and the security of the State of Israel. For your children do this, for your grandchildren do this, for Israeli children and Palestinian children and for Israel. Let them know that you stand behind negotiations that will lead to two states for two peoples living side by side in peace and security and that you are part of the great constituency for peace. Negotiations will be necessary, but there's a little secret about where they must lead. Two states for two peoples. Two states for two peoples. It's so great to see so many of you here tonight. I have to say, as we were talking this afternoon about whether or not this could go forward and whether or not we would be able to turn out more than a handful of people, I said, I'm from Washington, D.C. If we would have like half an inch of snow, this room would be completely empty. But this is Boston, yes. and you guys are tough, and you turned out tonight on behalf of a really great cause. So I thank you so much. It's, it's so bad to be here at the Boston Town Hall in support of the two campaigns. Uh, thank you for rising to the challenge that Secretary of State Kerry has laid before uh, the Jewish community, before the American people, which is to build a great constituency for peace that is going to be behind this administration's push to achieve a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There are so many of you in this room who have been involved in this movement and who have been active leaders not only in J Street, in Brit Sedek, in Amenu, in Reira, I can go through the litany of Americans for Peace Now, New Israel Fund, and whatever I'm not mentioning, 
you're going to get mad at me, I know, afterwards for not mentioning your organization, but I just see so many people in the room who have been at this for a very long time, and I appreciate your coming out and having the energy and the engagement uh, uh, to support us again. A couple of quick thank yous specifically for some people in the room. First of all, I do want to thank the J Street staff here in Boston who have worked so hard. Uh, very often. We stayed up on Saturday and back. They've done a terrific job. I want to also ask if, if all of those who are on the J Street uh, Executive Committee uh, here in Boston, all of those who were on the steering committee of the J Street chapter before that, all of those who were on the leadership of Brit Setting, everybody who has been involved, please don't be shy. Now is your moment. Please stand up because you deserve some recognition and thanks. Um, I am really, really grateful to everybody and to all of the people who are standing and, and so many more of you. Uh, Ambassador Alan Solomon did not stand up, but however, I would like to thank him as well for his leadership as a member of our national board now at J Street on his returns uh, from his service abroad, and so thank you for that. Uh, thank you for General Mitzna uh, for being here and for uh, enduring. Uh, we are about to have a third storm, of course, by the weekend. In just the five days that General Mitzna is in town, in, in the country, we managed to jam-pack three uh, northeastern storms, and so I think that might be a little bit of a record. Uh, so I thank you for your service uh, to our country through this and to your country through these incredible uh, stormy waters and weathers. Uh, I want to ask you all uh, to join me in standing up. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of questions, and you're each going to stand up as you have a positive answer. I want to get you up and off your feet. The two campaign is more than about sitting in your chairs and listening to those of us who are up here on the Bima speak. It's more than some interesting dialogue. It's going to be about actually to see people on their feet. So let me start by asking you a couple of questions, and the right way to answer it is to stand up and wave your sign, make some noise, and, and at the end we'll, we'll have everybody up here who has cameras from Jason to take a picture of all of you, and we're going to post this on the web and get to show the energy that's in the room in the middle of a foot of snow. So let me start by asking you to stand and wave your sign and make some noise. Do you remember in September of 1993? All right, the J3U crowd, you're exempt. <laughs> the rest of you, do you remember in September of 1993, listening to Yitzhak Rabin on the south lawn of the White House at the signing of the Oslo Accords, and that memorable moment when he said that we have seen enough of blood and tears. It is time to end this conflict. So please stand up and wave your signs and remember that. Now, for those of you who are still sitting, well, that's a pretty good turnout right there. Do you remember that in 2000, President Clinton laid out the parameters of what the end of this conflict should look like? And we all said to ourselves, of course, that's exactly what we need. What is so difficult? So if you, were, you, you remember that moment in 2000 at the end of the Camp David process, and we were so close, and you said to yourself, why can't we just get there? Please stand up, wave your sign, let's make some noise. If you are still sitting, how about in 2008? This goes to the J Street U crowd. Do you remember when J Street and J Street U were founded, you first heard about our work, did you say to yourself, the time has come? for this voice to redefine what it means to be pro-Israel, to fix what's broken in our politics, what too often stands in the way of real American leadership to get Israelis and Palestinians to a two-state agreement. Then join us and stand up and wave your signs and let's make some noise. I am, I am really excited, and I thank you and, and everybody who now you can sit back down until your hearts are racing a little bit faster than when you're just sitting there. Uh, I, I'm really excited that we're at the next moment in this incredible fight. It's a really important time. In the coming months, as the two campaign as J Street, we have our work cut out for us because we have to build a base of support in this country to support what President Barack Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry are trying to do to bring about that vision that Yitzhak Rabin had, that Bill Clinton had, uh, and that so many before them have laid out for us. But this is the first time through all of those decades and across all of those efforts that we have had an organized and powerful peace constituency ready to back the leaders in this country and to back the leaders of Israel and the leaders of the Palestinian people to take courageous steps to resolve this conflict. 
So much has changed since a generation or two ago. 30 years ago, the very idea of a two-state solution was almost unimaginable. Only the most radical Jews and Israelis were meeting with Palestinians and talking about peace. For Palestinians, armed resistance seemed to be the only path to freedom, and little thought was given to diplomacy or compromise. But today, in just the space of a generation, a solid majority of both Jews and Palestinians understands and supports the need for a negotiated two-state solution. And today, even the most right-of-center prime minister that Israel has ever had makes the case publicly that if Israel is to remain both Jewish and democratic, then there must be a Palestinian state alongside it. And here in the United States, we have 80% support in the American Jewish community now for a two-state solution. We all know how the opportunities for compromise and for peace in the past have been missed. We understand that the leaders on one side or the other have failed. But now, as we reach another of these critical moments, perhaps the most important of these moments in the century-long history of this conflict, we know this time has to be different. And we as Americans, particularly as Americans with a deep affection for Israel, we have an enormous role to play. Because only with outside help, only with a friendly push, will the two leaders, Benjamin Netanyahu and Mahmoud Abbas, choose the path of peace and compromise. And we are fortunate that we have a Secretary of State, your own, Massachusetts's own, John Kerry, who couldn't be more deeply committed to reaching an end to this conflict. And we have a President in Barack Obama who recognizes the importance of that objective to America's national interest. In the coming weeks, they are going to take a critical step toward our goal. The Secretary is going to put forward a framework for ending the conflict, creating a moment of decision, and pressing the leaders to make some tough choices. So we have come together tonight to say to the Secretary of State, to say to the President, to say to the Congress, that there is a great constituency for peace in this country that supports the United States bringing to bear its full power to end this conflict and realize a two-state solution. <laughs> to say loudly and clearly the two-state solution is the only solution. It isn't an option. It's a necessity for Israel's survival as the democratic home of the Jewish people. It's a necessity to provide the Palestinian people with the freedom and the self-determination to which they are entitled. It's a necessity to ensure that future generations of Jewish and Palestinian children can grow up in peace and security. And let's be honest, we know the voices of opposition are going to be loud. We will hear from the Naftali Bennett's we will hear from the settlers and their supporters, there must be no compromise. We will hear that there is no partner for peace on the other side. We will hear the litany of failures of the past. And in fact, many in the Jewish community, in Israel and on Capitol Hill, are already beginning to say that the United States and the Secretary should maybe pull back a little, step back and don't push quite so hard. Well, as that pushback comes, we must be, and we will be, Ready through the two campaign, J Street and you will demonstrate the deep support that exists in the United States for ending this conflict peacefully and diplomatically. We are going to gather tens of thousands of signatures on a petition that expresses our support for the Secretary's effort. We are going to gather by the thousands in town halls just like this one across the country to show our support. We will organize hundreds of educational programs in synagogues, community centers, supporters' homes, from one side of this country to the other. We will speak out, we will lobby, we will run ads. And to do that, and to win, and to do it successfully, we're going to need your help. We need the hundreds who are here, the thousands who are attending these town halls across the country, to mobilize your friends and family. So we have tens of thousands of people engaged in this campaign. And that's why this evening will end not simply with more speeches and talks, but with an advocacy fair where you can learn more about different opportunities to support the current negotiations. So I hope you'll take a few minutes at the end of this uh, event tonight and join in the fair and learn more about what you can do 
after tonight. In the weeks and months ahead, we'll be asking you to communicate a lot with your friends, with your family, with your communities. Uh, we're going to ask you to, to post on Facebook, to get your friends involved, forward on our action alerts, communicate your position to elected leaders in Washington, to tell the administration to continue to play the leadership role that they are playing. So I'm going to ask you to get started right now. And something you don't often hear from a speaker at an event like this, take out your cell phones. Take out your cell phones, turn them on, send an email, tell some friends that you're here, tweet about this event, text about it, use whatever social media I've never heard of to post a photo and tell people that you are here. Tell people to visit our website, 2campaign.org, that's the number 2campaign.org. Ask them to join the campaign that you're here tonight to learn about. We need more signatures, we need more tweets, we need more emails, making it clear that our community backs peace. You have a voice. We have a voice. So let's raise that voice together so President Obama and Secretary Kerry hear us and know we support them. Let's raise our voices so Israelis and Palestinians know we are with them. And let's raise our voices. And in the words of Dr. King, let us bend the arc of history toward justice and toward an end to this conflict. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Thank you for supporting J Street. Thank you for supporting the Two campaign. And I'm looking forward to hearing now from Howie Stanger and Katie Stewart, and I invite them to join me up here on stage. <laughs> I hate all Palestinians, and I think that they should die. 
Um, and I recognize that this is a feeling that he, along with many of his friends, had. Um, it was a feeling that was common, I would say, in, among these kids. And this experience, along with many of the other experiences that I had educating teenagers, these kids on workshop, uh, led me to understand and believe in the power that education has to change our society. Um, and what I realized, but upon coming back to America, what I realized was that I didn't want, simply want to educate for the sake of educating, but that I wanted to educate towards a concrete and <laughs> pragmatic goal. And when I came to Brandeis, I was given that opportunity in J Street. Um, and through J Street, I've been able to run programs for my peers that we, where we've been able to sit down and have more productive conversations uh, about these really Palestinian conflict and where nobody said, I hate Palestinians and I hope that they should all die. Um, yeah, so. so this year, as negotiations are restarting, many students are asking the same questions as Howie. How do we put our values into action? How do we build and demonstrate support for Carrie's initiative? And how do we move the institutions in our community to do the same? Our answer to those questions comes in the form of the two campaign. We're educating our communities on the four core issues of the negotiations. Borders, security, refugees, and Jerusalem. Building support for a politically viable two-state solution necessitates preparing our communities for difficult but necessary compromises. An undivided Jerusalem is incompatible with a two-state solution, as is the right of return. We have to ensure that our communities understand that. <coughs> Alongside our educational efforts, we've been circulating leadership letters on our campuses, picking out campus leaders to provide public support for a two-state solution and the specific parameters that we know must be included in a final status agreement. At Dartmouth, their leadership letter has gotten signatures from the student body president and vice president, leaders in Hillel and the Muslim Students Association, and people from the College Democrats and Republicans, and more. J Street U student leaders met with Senator Jean Shaheen two weeks ago, and she now knows that support for Secretary Kerry's work runs deep on their campus. Over in Western Massachusetts, Clark, UMass, and Smith are working together to use their letters to get Congressman Jim McGovern to speak on campus, which will help move students on their campuses to support negotiations at this critical time. Our efforts around the two campaign will culminate in a multi-day student <coughs> town hall in Washington, D.C. this coming April. We'll bring hundreds of students together, J Street U leaders, presidents of college gems and Republicans, student body presidents, and more, to engage publicly with our communal and political leaders and challenge them to do their part in making the two-state solution a reality. To support Secretary Kerry's diplomatic efforts in this important political moment, we have to ensure that support from our community for a politically viable two-state solution is loud and clear. At the end of the year, all of us should be able to look back and say that we did everything we could to secure the futures of Israelis and Palestinians through a two-state solution. Thank you. Two state solution. 
A conversation began among progressive Jewish organizations, some of which Jeremy referred to, uh, to try to build uh, and consolidate a voice of the American Jewish community that would be heard in Washington uh, on behalf of the two-state solution, on behalf, of, uh, on behalf of a peaceful resolution to the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, as is the case in any collection of Jews, uh, there were maybe 10 people in the room and 15 or 16 opinions. And it was not difficult, it was not easy uh, to forge uh, uh, consensus. The work that did come out of that conversation, uh, which would not have without Jeremy's leadership, was the creation of J Street. When it was started, people thought he was crazy. Uh, how was this little organization with this funny name going to uh, compete in the halls of Congress? Uh, and be heard, but because of Jeremy's, more, more than because of anything else, because of your persistence, uh, your doggedness, your organizing skills, today J Street is heard in the halls of Congress, it's heard in the White House, and it's heard throughout the American Jewish community and throughout the world. And I think we owe a great debt of gratitude to Jeremy Benjamin. skeptics about whether or not anybody would show up tonight, um, but I slept over here from a warm and dry house in the western suburbs for one reason and one reason only. It's the same reason why when I returned from Spain I rejoined J Street's National Board of Directors. It's because I believe in the survival of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. As an American and as a former American diplomat, I believe Israel's survival is critical to America's economic and security interests. Our prosperity and safety here at home is linked to Israel's prosperity and safety today and in the future. As a Jew, I feel connected to the land of Israel by my faith's teachings, by my people's history, and by the ties that bind me and my family today in the 21st century. I first visited Israel in 1971 as a volunteer to pick apples on a kibbutz in the northern Galilee, Far Bloom. My wife's grandfather was born a century earlier in what was then Palestine, and much of her extended family lived today in their hometown of Rehovah. My uncle began visiting Israel in the 1960s, and he is buried on the Mount of Olives. My brother and his wife made Aliyah more than 20 years ago, and they've raised five sons in Jerusalem, their home. I've attended all five bar mitzvahs and two of three weddings. Two cousins of mine also made Aliyah, and there will soon be more family members with the name Solomon, born Israeli than America. So you see, my ties to Israel are not only intellectual, political, and emotional, but they are personal as well. But Israel's survival depends on Israel's security, and Israel's security has been at risk for her entire 65-year history. Threats to Israel's security are destabilizing to the entire Middle East, and they threaten American interests in that region and around the world, and that has never been more true than it is today. But over the last decades, there has emerged a long-term solution to this instability that would protect both America's interests and Israel's, Israel's security so that my nephews can raise their children in peace. I am not alone, and we are not alone. A majority of American Jews, as Jeremy has pointed out, and a majority of Americans believe that our best hope, our only hope, for achieving some peace and stability for Israel and her neighbors is a two-state solution, a viable Palestinian state to fulfill the aspirations of the Palestinian people living next door to the Jewish state of Israel. The United States government, led by four different presidents of both parties, beginning with President George Herbert Walker Bush, who organized the first peace conference between Israelis and Palestinians in Madrid, each have understood that a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is vital to American interests, and the only way to protect the security of our most important democratic ally 
in that volatile region of the world. These four different presidents, however, have each been frustrated in their efforts to help Israelis and Palestinians achieve a two-state solution, however clear the contours of an agreement are to both sides and to the rest of the world. But due to the courage and tenacity of our own former Senator, Secretary of State John Kerry, whose sister-in-law is president of this temple congregation, Israelis and Palestinians are again sitting across from each other trying to succeed where others have failed. They need our help. They need the help of the United States government, and they need the help of the American Jewish community. There are too many naysayers on both sides who, for whatever reasons, are unwilling to make the difficult choices to reach an agreement that will protect Israel's security and bring some peace and stability to that troubled part of the world. If we want to be part of the solution and not part of the problem, we must drown out the voices of the naysayers and support the efforts of Secretary Kerry, President Obama, and their allies in Congress. Let me say finally that we are running out of time. As Secretary Kerry has said, the status quo is simply not sustainable. The dynamics of the world have changed. I saw this clearly as an American diplomat serving overseas. Israel's security, her very survival, cannot be guaranteed if the, if by a continuation of the ongoing conflict. There is a lot at stake. America's interests are at stake. American and Jewish values are at stake. But make no mistake about it. Israel's security and Israel's survival as a Jewish and democratic state is very much held in the balance. There is no one I know who can speak with more authority on these matters of Israel's security and survival than our very special guest, Amram Mitzna. I first met M.K. Mitzna when he was the mayor of Boston's sister city, Haifa, and I was the chairman of Combined Jewish Philanthropies of Greater Boston. We met first in Israel and then in Boston when Mayor Mitzna was also the head of the Labor Party and a candidate to be Prime Minister. In fact, I was honored, my wife Susan and I were honored to host him at our home in Weston. Amram Mitzna entered politics after a brilliant military career protecting and defending the State of Israel. After joining the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, in 1963, he fought in the 1967, 1973, and Lebanon Wars. He served first in the Army Corps and rose from tank commander to divisional commander. He was wounded twice and awarded two medals of distinguished service by the Israeli government. Before retiring from the IDF, General Mitzna served as overall commander in the West Bank during the early years of the first Palestinian Intifada and then as head of the IDF planning division. Last year, he returned to the Knesset, where he served a decade earlier, by winning election as a member of Tzipi Livni's newly formed party, Atnua. He is currently chairman of the Education Committee in the Knesset. Amram Mitzne is no stranger to Boston, and presumably no stranger to Boston snow, having received a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University. If you'd like to ask a question of M.K. Mitzne, please write it on the card that you should have found at your seat. But please join me now in welcoming an adopted Bostonian, Amram Mitzvah. Thank you very much and uh, good evening. Thank you, J Street, and thank you, Jeremy, and you. Uh, very courageous and ambitious staff in Washington, in Philadelphia, and here. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome, and thank you for hosting me here in this uh, very beautiful building, very beautiful uh, temple, and uh, it's really a feeling of being far away from home, but at home. So again, thank you uh, so much. Um, I would like to share with you some of my 
thoughts, some of my, the things that I believe, because I do feel that we are standing, maybe again, but this time in a very critical situation. We are standing in front of a, a moment of truth. The window of opportunities in the Middle East is still open. Very narrow, but still open. But not for a long time. This is a very uh, critical moment. And the, the period of time that we live in Israel is very critical to the future of the state of Israel. Now I know many, many times we Israelis are using the frame a critical time. Many, many times I used it before when I was trying to bring young officers to stay more years in the army. But I really mean that it is a critical time because you see the status quo cannot sustain. It is already 47 years since uh, the 67 war when we uh, went to war and we found ourselves with the Sunni Desert, with the Golan Heights, and with the West Bank. And uh, Levi Eshkol, then the Prime Minister, said when he wrote a decision to the government of Israel that the territories are called to negotiate in order to reach peace and end of conflict with the Palestinians. It was 47 years ago, and since then there is a status quo, ups and downs, but a status quo in this uh, situation. But no more, I don't think it can last another 47 years. And now we are facing a very, very energetic uh, uh, peace process, trying to bring the two sides to sit down and to reach a solution. Now, the failure of such a negotiation will create a new situation. <laughs> Status quo will not sustain. And the situation, if and when the uh, negotiation will fail, will be very, very dangerous, very, very harmful to the state of Israel. I'm not sure that there will be another opportunity. I'm not sure that the U.S. will once again put so much uh, energy, so much activity, and so much commitment that uh, the U.S. have done, the administration, Secretary Kerry, President Obama did in the last few years. It will create a new situation. In, uh, in the area in Israel, we might face a new uprising, we might face a third intifada, not like the first one, not like the second one, but a new one that will put again a question mark on our ability to stabilize the area. On the outside world, speaking about the international arena, we are already facing some kind of signs of boycotting, isolating the state of Israel. And we have to understand that the price might be very high. But speaking about the price, I think it's better to speak about the benefits, the fruits, if and when we will succeed to reach an agreement with the Palestinians. In my mind, we'll reach and we will have more security to the State of Israel. I'll speak about security later on. Uh, economic development, economic flourish, uh, international relations. Israel will be able to remain a democracy with a Jewish majority. And I think that uh, we will uh, 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 regain uh, stability in the area. No doubt also you are familiar with the Saudi initiative. No doubt that once we are uh, uh, succeeding 
to breach the difficulties with the Palestinians, we will uh, introduce relations with most of the Arab countries which is so necessary for us in the Middle East. Speaking about the situation today, I think that most people, most open-minded people, and I must admit that there are a lot of people that uh, have a closed mind and you can't argue with them, but those who have open-minded will, the majority of them, will understand, and they understand already, that the two-state solution is the only alternative. There is no other alternative. And I think it is very, very important to understand it. But the same majority that know that there is no other alternative but two-state solution, don't believe that it, impost, that it is possible to implement it. And this is the most problematic situation where we live. A lot of Israelis lost hope and they don't believe, even that they understand that it is a necessity, they don't believe that it is possible. Now, let's talk for a few minutes about what will the agreement based upon. First of all, the border between Israel and the Palestinian state will be based on the 67 line. There is no other way to describe the future border but to be based on the 67 line. Now, uh, most of the large uh, settlements will be part of the State of Israel on our side of the border. It will create a situation where at least between 70 to 80 percent of the Israeli settlers will be able to stay where they live and become Israeli citizens under the sovereignty of Israel on this side of the border. Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be united with its Jewish neighborhoods. I always prefer to speak about united Jerusalem than to speak about dividing Jerusalem. <coughs> because, you see, once Jerusalem will be uh, recognized as a capital of Israel, you probably know that most countries in the world do not recognize Jerusalem as Israel capital, but not only this. Speaking about all the neighborhoods, beginning of Gilo in the south and Givat Zeev in the north, it will be the largest Jerusalem ever since Jerusalem was mentioned in the Bible in the beginning. And Jerusalem, as I said, will be united with its Jewish neighborhoods. The Palestinian neighborhoods, which even today are not a real part of Jerusalem will be under uh, sovereignty of the new Palestinian state. Uh, speaking about the right of return, I, my opinion is that you cannot deny right from someone. So the question is not the right of return. The question is whether it will be implemented. And no Palestinians will be allowed to come back to where they lived, probably pre-48. This is a red line, and most people understand it, and uh, I uh, assume, not just assuming, but with a lot of discussions that I have with Palestinians, they understand. Because you see, accepting the right of return implementing the right of return of Palestinians into proper Israel, then there is a question, why should we separate the land between the river and the sea for two states if we are willing to accept Palestinians into Israel? The zone de eter of the will and the Israeli interest to uh, allow the Palestinians to have the state is because we want to keep Israel 
with the vast majority of Jews. And it will mean that Israel will be a Jewish homeland for the Jews, and of course, as a democracy. Now, speaking about security, yes, we'll have to have uh, security measures, um, like demilitarize a uh, new Palestinian state, like monitoring the borders, like having backing the international arena of the United States, and still for a long time, for a long, uh, many years, we need the IDF to be a strong military power. And I must admit that my grandchildren, I have eight of them, and maybe their grandchildren will still have to go to serve in the army because in order to keep us safe and secure, we will need for many, many years to come a very strong military power and a strong will to use it if uh, necessary. Now, once we agree, or once those who agree, that there is no other alternative and it is an Israeli interest to have a Palestinian state side by side to Israel, still there are some questions to answer. The first one, of course, is security. How can we secure Israel if we have a border between Palestine and Israel so close to our main cities, so close to Ben Gurion International Airport, so close to the sea? And I want to share with you that the, the fact that the concept of securing Israel is not based on defensible borders. In the region, in the Middle East, there is no defensible borders, speaking about geography and physical uh, condition on the ground. Let's go back, for example, to 67. 67 was a big, a big success, a military success. From where did we start it? From the most impossible defendable borders ever. 73. 73, the most defendable borders. The Suez Canal, the Golan Heights, the Jordan River, and yet if those of us who remember, I remember very well, I was a tank battalion commander in the 73 war, and we remember well, in the first week of the war, we were not sure that we are succeeding to protect the state of Israel. So there is no defensible borders. And territories do not have the significant role. So what is the basic idea? The basic idea is deterrence. Deterrence means that once the enemy, you, Palestinians, Jordanians, Egyptians, Hamas, Hezbollah dare to launch missiles or any other terror activity into Israel, we will run after you using all our military might in order that you will pay the price and understand that you have a lot to lose. This is the name of the game. And this is, by the way, the reason why Hassan Nasrallah is still in a bunker. Why Hassan Nasrallah is not ordering his units to launch missiles now, today, yesterday, tomorrow? Because he understands very well what will be the outcome of trying again to uh, uh, act against the state of Israel. I will may add that another important pillar of the concept of how to secure Israel is the relations with the United States, which is so essential. We couldn't succeed to come to where we are today if we had not had the support, the backing, and the friendship, not just friendship, but strategic cooperation with the United States. So this is the first question. 
The second question that I'm being asked many, many times, is there someone to talk with on the other side? In my mind, it is irrelevant question, because I come from uh, a place which I don't believe the Palestinians. I don't trust them. They will sign a paper and they will try not to fill up what they signed. This is what I understand, and therefore uh, it is necessary that the agreement will be as such that uh, we will be able to respond, to react, and to save and to secure Israel. Now, um, again, I want to share with you the idea that having a Palestinian state, or I will use the term, uh, separate ourselves from the Palestinians politically, it is an Israeli must. It is an Israeli interest. I may even say it is a vital interest for the state of Israel. We are not going to do it. We are not going to make so painful concessions to the Palestinians just because we feel that we owe them something. Just because we feel that we have done wrong with them since we have had Israel as independent country. No. We have to do it because it is an Israeli interest. And if you agree with me that this is the case, we can't allow ourselves to give to, other, to the other side, let's say the enemies, we can't give them the right to veto our interests. This is very important to understand. And by saying that there is no other one, uh, no, no anyone to talk on the other side, then we sacrifice our vital interest for the Palestinians to decide. Therefore, uh, it's, it's a good question whether we have someone on the other side to talk with, and I think that we have. I spent hours of discussing with the Palestinians. I belong to the group of Israelis that initiated the uh, Geneva Initiative, the Geneva Accord, and we reached an agreement, informal of course, because it was not done by government, and it is possible. But to those who don't believe that it is possible, to those who don't believe that there is anyone that we can negotiate on the other side, let us understand that once it is an Israeli interest, Israeli must, a vital interest for the state of Israel to separate ourselves politically from the Palestinians in order to have a democracy in Israel and a Jewish state, we must, we must uh, do it. Then there is another question, and the question is whether it is possible to implement, to execute an agreement, you know, some some people in Israel, probably uh, here in the United States, do feel that the situation in the territories is irreversible. And uh, more than one or two governments in Israel try to make the situation on the ground irreversible. Well, I think that it is reversible. It is very tough. It will be very, very difficult to uh, relocate even 20% settlers. Uh, but yes, we can do it. We have done it in Gaza. It was not easy. But the people of the state of Israel showed that democracy is sustained and we are able to execute and to implement agreement one, it will be uh, signed. And the last question that we are asking ourselves, whether there is a political power or a political will to sign such an agreement. This is uh, maybe the toughest question, uh, because you know that we are now having an impossible coalition, a coalition where you have Abayta Yehudi with Naftali Bennett, on one side, 
Enat Noah, which I am a member of, with Tzipi Livni on the other side, Yair Lapid, with Yeshatid. And the most problematic situation is that the Likud, which Netanyahu is part of the Likud, most of the Knesset members of the Likud are more to the right than Netanyahu himself. And he is not in the middle. He is not in the center. So, yes, it is, and it will be, again, very difficult. Nobody promised us a garden of roses once we will reach an understanding, an agreement with the Palestinians, and we will have to implement it. There is a majority in the Israeli people. There is a majority in the Knesset, not in the coalition. I think that in few weeks to come, once uh, Secretary Kerry will introduce the papers that all of us are waiting to see what it will look like, and I hope it will not be just general sentences, but it will be more detailed. Once he will introduce this paper, uh, I'm sure that there will be a need to reshuffle the, uh, uh, the, 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 the coalition. And it is possible to do it, again, not easy. Our Prime Minister didn't prove till now that he is able to be brave enough taking such decisions, but I believe that responsibility, and he understands responsibility, uh, will, uh, will, will do its best, and I hope that we will be able to reach a political a decision about, about this. And speaking about political decisions, this is the time for me, as an Israeli, to admire what Secretary Kerry is doing. I think that we... <laughs> as an Israeli, I would like to thank him to doing what he's doing. And to appreciate not just his role, but his uh, key—that uh, he is a key player—and it is so important that. And, and I hope that he will continue with the energy that he uh, came with. I hope that he will not uh, be worried about some Israelis that are using very rough language against him. I think that. The best word that I can find to describe it is a chutzpah. <laughs> to speak in this voice, in these words, against the Secretary of the State of the only country in the world that is standing behind Israel, not just with words and decisions, but with physical support, is really a chutzpah. And, uh, and of course you, I think that uh, Jeremy said it uh, much better than I can say, what should you do here in the United States to support uh, uh, those that care for Israel, those who are pro-Israeli and yet don't go, you know, in the direction always that is dictated by some of the Jewish organizations here in the United States. To be a pro-Israeli is to support the two-state solution. I want it to be very clear. <laughs> to be pro-Israeli, it is to strengthen the uh, policy and the strategy of the administration today of the United States. And to deepen the commitment and the obligation and the support and the backing of the United States and the Jewish communities here in the United States for the two-state solution. And finally, I want to share with you some more personal uh, remarks. I was born in Israel. I participated in the war since I was 18. I fought and I led soldiers as a commander to battles that people didn't come back from them. 
and I really care about Israel. Since I remember myself, after I retired from the army, I'm always on the front line of what is important to do in Israel. Education, leading a uh, uh, city of Haifa. I led a small city in the southern part of Israel because it was necessary. <coughs> and uh, I am a proud Israeli and a proud Jew. And I want again to say that there is no future for the state of Israel without painful concessions, painful decisions to separate ourselves from the Palestinians and to let them have their own state. This will be a very painful uh, uh, decision, but it is a need. And we will be able to divert and to focus all our energy, all what we know to do so well, and with all what we succeeded to be on the front line, on the state of art of so many subjects in the global arena, in order that we will be able to focus and to implement and to uh, uh, divert all our energies to our local domestic interior issues. Those of you, and I know that you, 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 you know what's going on in Israel, and you know that despite 65 and more years of independence, we are still not really one nation. There is a lot to be done in our problems, you know, in the, in the large gap between the center and the periphery, between the societies that made Israel as it is. And without the international support to the state of Israel, and without keeping the moral uh, ideas, the moral issue of us as Israelis, as Jews, we will not be able to sustain. And as a human being, as a Jew, as a Zionist, as an Israeli, I don't want to go on with ruling over other people. It is impossible. <laughs> and there is no way to continue with such situation. You know, I give a lot of interviews in the Israeli media, newspapers, radio, and television. And more than a few times, I receive responses that uh, I would say are doubting my pride, uh, patriotism to the state of Israel. Some of them say, well, Mitzna, you have to give back your military ranks. Some will say, well, you are a, even a traitor. I'm not afraid. I'm not worried. Because I think this is a crucial time and we have to stand up and say what we feel, what we mean, and what we understand is the need to support the state of Israel, to care for Israel, therefore I'm there, and I ask you, don't hesitate to speak up, to say what you believe, to say what you think, and to bring uh, your voice. It is very important because, as I said before, being pro-Israel <coughs> is to fight, to struggle for the two-state solution. And finally, you know, we Israelis are known to be very brave in the battlefield. Let's, mean, let's be brave with the attempt and the drive to have peace in the area. Thank you very much.
you're all applauding for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good evening. I'm Shana Wasserman. I'm the Northeast Regional Director at J Street. So we spent the first part of the evening hearing from some incredible people, hearing from Jeremy Benamy, national the president and founder of J Street, hearing from MK Mitzna, hearing from former ambassador Alan Salamat. And now it's time to hear from you. So there should be some volunteers that are collecting cards. They'll be coming around. And hopefully we will get to, to all of them. So here's the, the first question. Um, the first question is, what do you think are the critical pressure points on Netanyahu? And how much is and how much is it Netanyahu versus other power brokers? <clears throat> well, I don't know to begin with. Uh, I think that uh, inside Netanyahu, there are three Netanyahu's. <laughs> the first one is a conservative, a right-wing uh, leader, educated by his father uh, not to give up, uh, not to believe to the Arabs, and so on and so forth. The second one is a prime minister. I spoke about the responsibilities of a prime minister in Israel uh, uh, have on his shoulders. And uh, I think that it was Ariel Sharon that said when he became a prime minister, that what he can see from where he sits, it's completely different. What he has seen being in the opposition or in the coalition, and it is true when you are a prime minister and you understand your responsibility, most of those who came from the right, I'm speaking about prime minister, beginning with Becky, even Shamir, Sharon, El Olmer, Sipi Livni, she wasn't prime minister, but she came from the deep right. Uh, once you sit on the chair and you understand what is responsibility, then you forget all what you said before. And uh, I hope that Netanyahu will understand his responsibility as a prime minister of the state of Israel. And the same Netanyahu is a politician. I said already how complicated the political structure in Israel, and he will have as a politician to make up his mind. Uh, he is now in his uh, third term. It seems to me, I don't know, but it seems to me that he cares less about being elected another time, but he, he thinks probably when he's with himself. You think about what is the legacy that you would like to leave after he will be Prime Minister and how he will be remembered in the history of the State of Israel. Please try to remember who are the Prime Ministers that we remember so well. It is those uh, Prime Ministers that made a change. David Ben-Gurion, Yitzhak Rabin, uh, begging Ariel Sharon, we will not remember the others because they didn't make any real change in their opinion and didn't really influence what happened in the Jewish land. So it was a long answer to a short question, but I really don't know what Netanyahu has in his mind, but he is the key player of what will happen in the next let's say a few months. Great, thank you. So we received, oh, did you want to play in there? Okay, great. Um, we received several questions, and I'm sure there are many more out there, about settlers and settlements. So I'm going to do my best to bundle them, and then you can answer as you see fit. So recently, there was a bill proposed in the Knesset to extend Israeli law to settlements on Settlements, sorry, in the Jordan Valley and in the Jordan Valley region, which, in effect, are an attempt to annex these areas. So, 
So the question is, would Hatsunoa, would your party oppose this recent bill? That's one question. The second question is about Netanyahu's recent public statement that some settlers could remain Israeli citizens under Palestinian sovereignty. Why did he go public with that now? And what do you think is really behind that statement? Why don't we start with those? Uh, there is a lot of uh, air blow of <laughs> slogans and uh, some ideas that uh, have nothing to do with reality. The politicians are usually green, and then you have a week or ten days of uh, a lot of uh, interviews, uh, a lot of knowledgeable, knowledgeable uh, people will react and, and, and respond, but nothing will come out of it. I count under this uh, this uh, 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 situation, a uh, liberal idea of a uh, uh, new border that will keep some of the Arab villages on the Palestinian side instead of being on the Israeli side, which is impossible to implement in a democracy. You can't take citizenship from someone just because you make a decision that the border will be here, not there. And it is the same with the idea that the settlements will be left under uh, the Palestinian state sovereignty. Because nobody uh, uh, believes that it is possible to have settlements that will be islands uh, of Israeli citizens protected by Israeli soldiers or police and obeying the law, the Israeli law. On the other hand, I think it will be wrong from the Palestinians not to accept that Jews will live in Palestine. I think it is, it is, it is basically that as Arabs can live in Israel, Jews can live in Palestine. But if you if you want as a Jew to live in the Palestinian in the, in the Palestine state, you have to be a Palestinian uh, citizen. You have to obey the Palestinian law. Let let's let's uh, let's let's them the, the Israelis on the Palestinian territory or the Palestinian state be like the Arab Israelis. Okay. None of the Israelis will stay there. <laughs> so, again, it is sentences that are being uh, uh, used, but practically nothing will happen to this. Now, speaking about the Jordan River, I don't think that we can expect the Palestinian state to allow that they will have a state surrounded all around with fence of wall by Israel, checking all those who will go in or out from the Palestinian state. On the other side, there is a need for at least few years till we have more uh, confidence that the agreement is working to have a presence of Israeli troops on the ground along the Jordan River. It cannot be a permanent uh, uh, situation, but for a few years it is possible, and uh, I believe that the Palestinians understand it. I think that even uh, Abu Mazen said a few days ago in an interview that he gave to the New York Times that it is acceptable, three, four years, five years, uh, uh, that some Israeli troops will remain along uh, the river. I don't want to go into too many details, but practically, military-wise, to have a narrow strip along the Jordan River as a permanent uh, 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 idea is impossible. So this is what I think, and I believe that this is what will be at the end of the day 
uh, under the agreement. Thank you very much. Um, the question to Jeremy is, how can American Jews support Israelis striving for a two-state solution? <laughs> you know what, I'm going to leave that to Celia, because she'll be up here at the end telling you a little bit about what you can do uh, as part of the two campaigns to support uh, the Secretary's work. So I'll let Celia handle that question. The softballs go from you. Uh, but here's a question for, for both of you. If history is any indication of what the future will be, any time we get close to an agreement, the uh, um, extremists on both sides start to ramp up, and there are some uh, violence on both sides. What is being done on both sides, particularly on the Israeli side, to prepare them for a peace agreement? Well, I, th I think it's very important to recognize that uh, the process of getting to an agreement is not one that leads to zero violence in the short term. And, and I think it is very important for people to recognize the closer that we get to an agreement, the higher the probability that spoilers will try on both sides through rockets and terror and, and other, uh, other methods. Uh, to derail this process and to instill fear that makes people pull back uh, from, from the courage that's needed to do what we have to do. And I do think it's important for the leaders on both sides to begin to prepare the people if they are serious. And I think that it is something that's missing uh, on both sides. There is very little discussion of these issues beyond the political class uh, in Israel and, and beyond very narrow circles in, in Palestine. And, and I think that's an issue. Uh, I, don't know you I fully agree with you. We know from the past that uh, once there is some kind of progress in the discussions, even not signing, <coughs> then uh, a lot of noisy and sometimes active uh, terror from the other side, uh, tough demonstrations on our side, we try to sabotage to derail the process. Uh, once an agreement is signed, then I will worry less. The problem is that there will be a, a lot of effort uh, in order to stop, in order to, uh, to um, derail the uh, negotiation. And the reason why it is uh, so quiet now uh, is it because most people don't believe that something uh, positive will come from these discussions. And you can see, if you are following the declarations coming maybe from the right, is when they feel that uh, Tipe Livni is smiling, then uh, you'll have uh, uh, some kind of, uh, of political uh, uh, announcement, political declaration, I think the Bennett said, just uh, yesterday, that uh, if the paper will be put on the table and it will uh, be more detailed than before, they will not be able to stay as part of the government. Let's hope that it will happen. <laughs> your mouth to God's ears, right? So we have time for one more question. I want to know that there were many questions about borders, about Jerusalem, other ones about settlements, um, a great one about Hamas. So now he's going to talk about during the reception and um, advocacy fair afterwards. But the final question for you to answer right now is Amani Shana Halayla has that question. What makes this agreement, this framework that Carrie has been working on, something will be shared soon, what makes this framework different from all other peace agreements? I think that I, uh, I answered this question in my uh, speech. Uh, I think that the, the efforts that are being uh, used now, the energy, the commitment, of Secretary Kerry and President Obama bring us to a place where it is very unique. Now, you know, 
uh, Obama had still two years in, uh, in, in office, so it's a lot of time. So we still have time to go ahead. If you remember, when Clinton came, President Clinton came with the Clinton Initiative, it was a few months before he was leaving his office. El Barak then, the Prime Minister, lost his uh, political power. So, and they, both of them were at the end of their uh, uh, role. Um, Prime Minister uh, Eud Olmert, which came with uh, even a more detailed and, and more willing to accept uh, some Palestinians' demand, but again, he was in his last months or two months before he had to leave uh, the office. Today, it's completely different. And I think that uh, international arena is different than it was before. There are so many signs that once uh, the talks will fail, uh, the Palestinians will go to the UN, they will have a majority, the uh, European countries and some other countries in the world might uh, 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 try to isolate Israel, uh, boycott Israel, and in so many... Uh, so, so this is a completely different situation than it was uh, in, in uh, the past. And therefore, going back to what I said in the beginning of my uh, speech, is that it is a crucial time. And the window of opportunity still open, but not for a long time. Thank you both very much for your... everyone for your questions. I'm delighted now to invite up Celia Siegel, the co-chair for Advocacy for J Street Boston. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, uh, General, for coming all the way from Israel and for all of you for plowing out your driveways. I know it took a lot to pull myself away from scandal. Uh, <laughs> Um, my name is Celia Siegel. I'm one of the new co-chairs for advocacy uh, at J Street Boston, along with Margie Klein, who's in there, there in the back. Woo! I also grew up in Temple, Israel, so I kind of feel like I'm on my home turf here. Um, I see a lot of people who I know, and I know you guys are advocates, so you guys are my types of people. Um, tonight we've heard over and over again that now is a critical time to act. Massachusetts is poised to lead, to make strides in a conflict that has lasted all of our lifetimes. The day after President Obama's inauguration in 2009, almost five years ago exactly, I walked across the border from a lot into Jordan. At the time in 2009, the battle in Gaza was stirring an international debate. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have walked across that border. But if you have, you know that on the Israeli side, there's one checkpoint with a lot of guards and guns and fence, automatic fences. And on the Jordan side, about 100 feet away, there's the same, similarly, with a big automatic gate, uh, a few guards and a gun. And you have to walk through. No guards, no cars are allowed. And I remember walking from the Israeli checkpoint to the Jordanian checkpoint, this big 100-foot dead zone like in a movie, clutching my passport as if it were a briefcase. I was about to hand off and hearing my parents' voices admonishing me in my head. Uh, and as I approached the Jordanian guards, I took a deep breath as they looked at my passport. And they looked at me and with a big, toothy grin, screamed, Barack Obama, he's Muslim, right? <laughs> Before giving me a high five and passing me right through. It was clear to me right then uh, that we had a real opportunity here. <laughs> we, had, we had good will, will around the world in places where I had no idea what to expect. And after years of building walls and starting wars, I had renewed hope. 
uh, in our ability to lead in making this world a better place. Do you guys remember that feeling five years ago? When George Mitchell was appointed as the head of the envoy in the Middle East, uh, the same George Mitchell who solved the conflict in Northern Ireland, in the days, in, remember that feeling that the days were, of this conflict were numbered? That hope, that window opportunity that we've heard so much talk about here tonight is still open, and we cannot allow that window to shut. Now more than ever, we have a role to play. We must let Secretary Kerry and the President know we are behind them, and we must organize so that legislators know where we stand and so that they will act. The two campaign, which you've heard here tonight, is that tool. So when that moment comes, we are prepared to act. Raise your hand if, or your sign if you've uh, signed the petition on the two campaign. Great. The two campaign not only affirms that we are ready, it educates our members what we are ready for. It affirms that we understand that compromises and hard conversations will happen on these issues, uh, on borders and settlements and security, Jerusalem and refugees. It affirms that we understand that this is difficult and says to the world that we believe that by making these compromises, we see Israel as stronger. Please sign, if people will take a moment now who haven't signed the two campaign petition. Uh, everyone has a little white card on your chairs. Uh, please take a moment now to sign that little white card. You can also, for those of you I saw Twitter was blowing up when I was in my seat, you can also tweet to sign the petition. You can tweet two states to 69866. Or sorry, you can text it. Uh, and it will prompt you with some questions, and if you answer them, you will be officially signed on to the petition. But everyone also received another card when you came in here. It's that little white card. Uh, one with little check boxes. If you are willing to collect more petitions at your synagogue, at your day school, amongst friends and families, check that little white box at the top of that card. If you're willing to host a house party, Check that box. If you're willing to write a letter to the editor or make a donation, if you're willing to contact your member of Congress, check those boxes on that card. How many people live in Captain Clark's new district? A few people. Great. Ten out of our 11 members of our congressional de delegation have signed on to a resolution to support the president's leadership. We need Congresswoman Clark to make it 11 out of 11, and we will be is it the first state to have our entire delegation onto this resolution? We want to be that first state. I'll give people a few minutes to fill out that card. Uh, we have volunteers over in the corner and in the back there coming through the aisles to collect them. If you want uh, to just pass it to the end of the aisle, they will come and pick them up. If you tweet, now is the time to tweet hashtag two campaign. We already took our picture, so I don't think we need to that. Again, five years ago, I gave a high five to that guard at the Jordanian border. Today, after major shifts in the Middle East, we are putting all of our weight into keeping that window of opportunity open. Please join us in this movement and in the lobby for refreshments afterwards. Uh, visit our action tables and learn more about J Street or J Street U. Find out how to bring the two campaign to your home and community. Everyone. We'll leave here doing something. Thank you very much. So that's it. That's the final speaker of the evening. I want to say thank you to everybody who helped put this evening together. I want to thank everybody who came out through this weather. I really appreciate your uh, energy, spirit, perseverance. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Please join us in the hall. Sign up to do some things in the community, and I look forward to working with you in the coming year of the two campaigns. Thank you very much.